أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to begin by extending my congratulations to all of you as we are still in the uh, the days of the uh, the birth of Lady Fatima to Zahra, salawatullahi alayha. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he illuminates our hearts with her teachings and he crowns us with her intercession on the day of Qiyamah. We left off at verse number 11, inshallah, in tonight's session we'll be covering verses 11 through 13 of Surah Al-An'am. In verse number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, addressing the Holy Prophet, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قُلْ سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ انْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ If you remember, brothers and sisters, in ayah number 6 of Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Quraysh who are essentially the primary audience in these verses. And he asks them in ayah number six, as you may recall, أَلَمْ يَرَوْا كَمْ أَهْلَهِمْ مِنْ قَرْ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا لَمْ نُمَكِّنْ لَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to Quraysh that don't you see that we have destroyed other nations before you for their transformation? transgression for the prophets, nations that if, if compared to much more sophisticated, they had more military might. So Allah is telling them that don't think that you're invincible. There are nations that came before you that were much more powerful and they were still, despite their power, they were utterly destroyed. And we spoke about the examples of Ad, of Thamud, of Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking them to consider the fate of these past nations who were punished for their iniquity and their rebelliousness. So ayah number 11 is a continuation of that discussion. But there is a stark difference between ayah number 11 and ayah number 6. In ayah number 6, Allah is asking them to think, to reflect upon the fate of these superpowers of the past who rejected the truth, who fought the messengers of Allah. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially telling them that don't take my word for it. Go and witness the remains and the ruins of these past civilizations. So you find that the, the, the admonishment is escalated a bit. Because there's a, there's a difference between Allah asking them to think about past nations and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, I want you to go and witness the remains of these past nations. It's similar to saying, what's the difference between thinking about death and going and witnessing ghuslul mayyit? The ibrah that you get from seeing something with your eyes is more powerful than just thinking and reflecting upon it. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, don't take my word for it. I, I have shared with you the, the stories of past nations. You may know of them, but I want you to take a step further. I want you to actually travel. The, the Prophet tells them, seer fil arf, travel through the land, travel through the earth, and behold, Travel through the land and behold the fate 
of these past nations, these individuals, these nations who rejected the truth. Now it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's speaking to the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula, the Quraysh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that Quraysh, they are essentially nomadic. Many of them, they travel. We, we know that in Surah Quraysh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشْ إِلَافِهِمْ رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ The Arabs, they had two business voyages every year. In the summertime, they would make a trip to Syria for trade, for business. And in the winter, they would travel to Yemen. So Allah is essentially telling them that when you go on these journeys, when you travel to Syria, to Yemen, in addition, in addition to gaining worldly benefits, in addition to making profit, Allah says, I want you to consider, I want you to pay attention. I want you to observe and witness the ruins of these past civilizations. Zamakhshari, who is a, a Sunni commentator of the Holy Quran, he has a very interesting discussion about the word thumma in this ayah. He asks the following question. He says, Why didn't Allah say, so why is the word thumma used as opposed to the fa? Fa was sababi, as we call it in Arabic. Zamakhshari, who is an expert in the Arabic language, he says, if Allah were to have said, it would mean that Allah is commanding them to travel for the sole purpose of taking lesson from witnessing these ruins of past civilizations. But when Allah says, Thumma, travel in the land and behold what happened to these past nations. This Thumma means, I'm not asking you to make your travels all about Ibra, all about drawing lessons. Go and enjoy and conduct business, but make it at least one of the benefits of your travel, that whenever you travel, you observe and you ponder and you reflect and you contemplate over these nations that existed before you, that they were superior to you, they were more sophisticated, and yet because of their defiance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them. So again, it's interesting that when you look at this ayah, there is a difference between reflecting upon certain realities and witnessing them, just like with the example of death. It's much more effective for you to witness someone who's in their last moments, to witness the, the washing for the burial, to witness an actual burial, rather than just to think about death. Similarly here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I don't only want you to think about Fir'aun and Ad and Thamud. I want you to actually go and see the, the body of Pharaoh, the mummy of Pharaoh. I want you to see the ruins of these civilizations. So it's a powerful reminder for you that it doesn't matter how much power you have. You can, be, you can, have, the, you can have the wealthiest civilization. You can have the most military might, the most technology. If you defy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will punish you. There is nothing that will, that will protect you and safeguard you from divine punishment. And then you find in this ayah, Allah uses the word aqibah. The word aqibah here is an important word, and I want to reflect upon it for a few moments. The word aqibah means the end. Allah wants us to pay attention to the end the end result, the, the final, the fate of these, these nations. In Islamic thought, we have the concept of husnul aqiba and su'ul aqiba. In fact, we have many supplications where we ask Allah, Allahumma rzuqna husnul aqiba. Oh Allah, grant us a good ending. 
Because the most important thing in life is not your spirituality at this very moment. The most important thing in life is your spiritual state before you depart this world. How the story of your life ends. This is why Prophet Ya'qub, Nabi Ya'qub when he was on his deathbed, he addresses his sons. It's mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. And kuntum shuhada id hadara Ya'qub al-Mawt when Ya'qub was on his deathbed. He's the son of Nabi Ishaq. His children are around him. Am kuntum shuhada id hadara Ya'qub al-Mawt id qali li banihi ma ta'buduna min ba'di when he said to his children, what will you worship after me? And in other places in the Quran, he advises them not to die unless they are in a state of being submissive to Allah. Because someone may live in obedience to Allah, but they deviate in their last days. This is known as Su'il Aqibah. And then you may have someone who is, who is wicked, who is a sinner, who defies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then they get this hidayah at the end of their lives. I'll give you a couple of examples of husn al-aqibah and of su' al-aqibah. When, when it comes to husn al-aqibah, there's a very beautiful example in the Quran of husn al-aqibah, having a good end. If you go to Surah Taha, Surah number 20, Ayah number 70, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about Saharat Musa, the magicians who came forward to challenge Nabi Musa. These are individuals who were kuffar. They were hired by Fir'aun to disprove and to debunk the claim of Musa. So these are individuals who are on the wrong path. They're not on Salat al-Mustaqim. They're from among al-Maghubi alayhim. They're from among al When they witness the mu'jiza of Musa, they see the staff of Musa transform into a serpent and it consumes their ropes. Allah in ayah number 70, he says what? فَأُلْقِيَ السَّحَرَةُ سُجَّدًا when the magicians witnessed this mu'jiz, not only did they say that, okay, we concede, we, we've been defeated, we believe in Musa. They were so impacted by witnessing the truth that they fall down into sujood. We believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. But it doesn't stop there. Look at how strong their faith is. And how strong their conviction is. In the next ayah, Fir'aun issues a threat when he sees that the magicians that he hired to challenge Musa have now fallen into prostration and they've professed belief in the religious movement of Musa. Fir'aun says, What? You believe you believe in Musa before consulting with me meaning that if you want to change your religion you need my permission Fir'aun starts to throw out accusations that you know this is a game that you're playing Musa is your your master and he's the one who taught you sorcery and then he threatens them he threatens to amputate their limbs. Now ask yourselves, brothers and sisters, if someone is threatening to amputate your limbs and he's threatening to crucify you because of your faith, most of us, we would perhaps bow to Fir'aun just to save our lives or maybe even prostrate to him. But what do the magicians do? They respond. So in, on the same day, they began the day as kuffar. They submit to the truth. And not only did they, did they submit to the truth, even death threats do not shake them. 
قالوا in the next ayah, ayah number 72. قالوا لن نؤثرك على ما جاءنا من البينات. Pharaoh had offered them money, position. He says to them that if you defeat Musa, you will be among al-muqarrabin. I will bring you close to me. وَالَّذِي فَطَرَنَا فَقْضِ مَا أَنْتَ قَابَ And they say to Pharaoh, do as you wish. Meaning, look at حُسْنُ الْعَاقِبَة That they go from being kuffar, magicians who are challenging a messenger of Allah. They accept faith. They are being threatened by the tyrant of their time and they are willing to die for the sake of haq in a matter of one day. In a matter of one day. This is an example of husn al-aqibah. And I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, if you were to study the biographies of these individuals, they must have done something in their lives, amal salih, they must have done something that Allah was so pleased with them that he gave them the tawfiq of hidayah. It's not, this is not random. These magicians, when Musa was speaking and lecturing, they were probably listening. His words affected them. They may have done some good deeds that Allah gave them the tawfiq of hidayah. And they become shuhada. So in one day, they go from the world of kufr to the world of iman, and they're crowned with shahada. They become martyrs. Another example is, during the, the lives of the Ahlul Bayt, during the time of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhan, salawatullahi alayhi, there was a man by the name of Bishr. Bishr, he lived in the city of Medina, and he was a sinful person. He used to hold parties at his residence almost every night. He used to, have, he used to serve alcohol. He would bring singers and dancers. And he was corrupting a lot of the youth of Medina. So some of the parents of these youth, they decide to bring the issue to Imam al kadhim They say to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, this bishr is corrupting our youth. He's holding these extravagant parties in his home where alcohol is served. They're singing and dancing and mingling between the genders. They ask the Imam to intervene. The Imam one day he passed evening, he passes Bishr. As he's passing by, he can hear the music and the dancing. That moment, it so happened that one of the servants of Bishr was taking out some trash. Imam al salam he asks this maid, Sayyidu Kihurun Am Abd, is your master? A free man or a slave? The woman was puzzled. She says, of course he's a free man. He's free. He's not a slave. The Imam salam says, you're right. Because if he was a slave of Allah, he would be ashamed of what he's doing. And the Imam walks away. When the maid of the house, Bishop noticed that she took longer than usual to take out the trash and return. He asks her, what happened? Why did, what took you so long? She says that when I was taking out the trash, I saw a man who asked me a very puzzling question. He says, what did, what did he ask you? He asked me, is your master, is the head of this household a free man or a slave? And I told him that he is a free man. When I said to him he's a free man, he shook his head and he says, indeed, you're right. Because if he was an abd of Allah, if he was a slave of Allah, he would have some shame. Bishr, he was affected by these words. He went and he knew that no one could speak to him in this way and no words could have an impact like this unless it came from the Ahlul Bayt. So he goes and he leaves his house and he leaves his house barefoot. This is why in history he's known as Bishr al-Hafi, Bishr the barefooted. He leaves his house and he felt so humiliated. He runs after Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam and he vows to the Imam that he's going to repent and he's going to stop having these gatherings and he's going to have an, a complete transformation. And indeed he does. He becomes a very pious man for the rest of his life. After he has this transformation, he goes from being someone who's hosting parties and serving alcohol to someone who becomes a student of the Imam. 
Some of his companions, his friends, they asked him, Bishop, there are many people who live a life of sin and they never get the tawfiq of guidance. What did you do in your life that Allah, he guided you through Imam al kafir Why you and not someone else? There are many people who live your life and they continue until the end of their lives. He says to them that one night I was returning from a party and I was walking through the alleyways and I came across a dumpster and beside the dumpster I saw a page of the Quran that had some impurities on it. I was very tired, I looked at it and I thought to myself that let me just go home but I thought to myself that you know what this is a a page of the Quran this is Allah's words so I took this page of the Quran and I purified it from the najasa that was on it and I put this page of the Quran in a river or I, I, I purified it and I, I removed it from the rubbish he says that night I went to sleep and I had a dream in the dream I heard a voice speaking to me saying ya bishop tayyabta ismi la utayyibanna ismaka fi dunya wal akhir that oh bishop you purified my name you elevated my name i will elevate your name in this life and the hereafter this one good deed this moment of tawajjuh this moment of sincerity bishop says if i were to examine my life i think it was that moment where i gave value to allah's words where i i respected that page of the quran that allah gave me the tawfiq of hidayah that's why brothers and sisters don't ever underestimate the value of any good deed it could be that one good deed that allah gives you that husn al -aqib. and unfortunately we have examples of su al -aqib. we have examples of people who are righteous who are pious and then at the end they have a bad ending one famous example is Az Zubair ibn al Awam. Zubair, companions of the Holy Prophet. Zubair was one of the most courageous of the Sahaba. In fact, Zubair, after the death of Rasulullah, there were four individuals who were willing to fight alongside Amir al Mu'mineen when Abu Bakr usurped the Khilafah. One of them was Zubair. Imagine, he was loyal to the Holy Prophet. And he was loyal to Amir al muminin in the days immediately after the death of the Prophet. But what happened? The dunya became attractive in his eyes. He had a son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, who used to push him towards worldly matters, towards worldly acquisitions. This Zubair ends up fighting against Amir al muminin in the battle of Jaman. And he is killed in the battle of Jaman. Amir al muminin alayhi salam, when he was walking among the dead in the battle of Jaman, he saw the dead body of Zubair and he saw the sword of Zubair. Amir al muminin alayhi salam, he picks up the sword of Zubair and the Imam's eyes fill with tears. And he says, Sayfun talama kashaf al karbi an wajh Rasulullah. He says, What a tragedy. This is, this is a sword that used to defend Rasulullah. And today this was a sword that came to, fought against, to fight against Ali ibn Abi Talib. So brothers and sisters, it's important for us not to get too comfortable. That's why we always pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us on the straight path. That we don't deviate. That we're appreciative, we, are, we appreciate Allah's guidance. That Allah keeps us on the straight path and we don't stray in our last moments. We have to always pray for husn al aqib So this ayah, if we go back to it, قُلْ سِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ By the way, this قُلْ, Allah is telling the Holy Prophet, tell them, قُلْ, O Muhammad, say to them, travel through the earth, and behold, how these nations, how the deniers fared in the end. This qul that we find throughout the Quran 
is an important reminder that the Qur'an is not the word of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa That the Qur'an is being dictated to the Prophet from a higher power. Because if the Quran was the if the Quran was written by the Prophet, we would not find any qul. The Prophet wouldn't say to himself, "Say to them." So you find that this qul that we see throughout the whole of the Quran is Allah's way of reminding us that just because it's Muhammad who is reciting the Quran to you, the source of this Quran is the Creator of Muhammad. قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ in the next ayah, in ayah number 12, Allah says, قُلْ O Muhammad, say to them, قُلْ لِمَنْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Say to them, who's them? Presumably it's Quraysh, the Meccans. Because again, Surah Al-An'am is a Meccan surah, so they're the primary audience. Say to them, ask them, O Muhammad, Say, to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and on the earth? In the previous ayah, Allah subhanahu in the previous verses, Allah was speaking about His supreme power, His ability to destroy these powerful civilizations for their iniquity and their rebelliousness. Here Allah is reminding us that He's able to do that because He owns, He possesses, He's the owner of everything that is in the heavens and on the earth. Say to them, O Muhammad, لِمَمَّا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Ask them, to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and on the earth? And it's interesting, Allah, He says to the Prophet, قُلْ لِلَّهِ Don't even give them the opportunity to answer because it's so evident, it's so obvious. They, we don't even need to wait for them to answer because their fitrah knows the answer. قُلْ لِلَّهِ Say to them that it's Allah. Not only is Allah the creator of the heavens and the earth, He's the owner of the heavens and the earth. Because not every creator owns. You might hire someone to build a house for you, but they don't own it. Allah is Al Khaliq and He is Al Malik. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth, and He retains that ownership. It's not granted or given to anyone after it's created. كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Say to God, He has prescribed mercy for Himself. If you read every verse in the Qur'an, there is no attribute of Allah that is more supreme and more pronounced and more emphasized than Allah's mercy. In fact, in the beginning of 113 surahs of the Holy Quran, Allah introduces Himself to us using two of His names. And both of those names are derivatives of Rahman. Allah could have said, Bismillah al Aziz al Hakim, Bismillah al Khaliq al Malik. But Allah chooses two names that are both derivatives of Rahman. And Allah, nowhere in the Qur'an does He say, كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الْحِكْمَةِ or كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ ال... ال... كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الْعِزَّةِ كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الْعَادِ Allah doesn't say, I prescribe justice upon myself or I prescribed wisdom upon myself. Allah says, I have prescribed mercy upon myself. كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ and it's interesting, if you look at the word Rahma, linguists say that it's actually derived from Rahim, which means the womb. Because the relationship that that fetus has with its mother is similar to our relationship with Allah. Because that fetus in the womb of its mother relies entirely on its mother. All of its nourishment comes from the mother. And the fetus doesn't see the mother. And this is similar to our relationship with Allah. Our sustenance comes entirely from Him. He cares for us. He provides us. But we have not seen Him. In the same way the fetus has not seen the mother, 
we have not seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our physical eyes. So this rahma, according to some linguists, is derived from rahim, which means womb. And then when Allah, after Allah speaks about the fact that he has prescribed mercy upon himself, he then speaks about the hereafter. He speaks about the day of Qiyam. Now what is the link between divine mercy and life after death? When we speak about Alamul Akhirah and how to prove the existence of a hereafter, there are many arguments that are put forward. For example, we, we invoke the argument of divine justice, that divine justice dictates that there is an afterlife because it would be unfair, unjust of Allah to leave the murderer without punishment and the murdered without compensation. So you find that divine justice is used as proof for the hereafter. Allah's wisdom is also used as proof for a hereafter, that it would be in vain for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create this vast universe for a short period of time and then destroy it and there's nothing beyond it. But here, Allah uses qanun ar-Rahma as a proof for the existence of the hereafter and it's interesting so here Allah is saying this is the only ayah where Allah points and he uses his mercy as proof for a hereafter because after he says what does he say how do we use Allah's rahmah as a way of proving akhirah proving qiyam proving akhirah I'll give you a very simple example. If there is a child that is starving, that is hungry, and you give them a tiny morsel of food, you just give them a little bit of food and you don't give them any more. And you said there is nothing but this morsel, that's all you get. Knowing that this child is hungry, is this merciful or is this what? That's cruel. Someone who gives a morsel of food to a child who's starving is someone, when, he, when they have the ability to give them, you would say that this is a cruel person, this is a merciless person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a taste of existence. We, human beings, we inherently crave eternal life. We crave it, just like the child that craves food so they can be satiated and you call the, the the parent that gives that child a morsel of food cruel because you have the power to satiate and fulfill fill the hunger of that child but you don't allah gave us a taste of wujud allah is just going to take it away and that's it he's going to give us a little taste when we crave khulud he gives us only a taste and he takes it away allah says no I am so merciful that I'm not going to just give you a taste of existence and take it away from you. When I give you existence, I'm going to give it to you in a way that fills the craving that you have for existence, which is achieved only by what? Eternal life. Allah has prescribed mercy upon himself. This lamb in layajma'annakum and the shadda upon the noon. By the way, in the Arabic language, whenever you see a shadda, know that in reality there are two letter noons. This lamb is known as lamul qasam, the lamb of oath taking. And the noon is noon al tawqeed. So here Allah is making an oath and he's using the noon of emphasis to say what? That I will indeed gather you all. For what? For the day of resurrection. There are many names that are given for the day of judgment. In fact, one of the ulama was telling me that one day, I thought to myself, how many 
names has Allah given for the day of Qiyamah? How many different descriptions are given for the day of Qiyamah? We have Yawmuddin, Yawmul Hasra, Yawmul Qiyamah, At-Tamah, and the list continues. One of the ulama told me that I went through the entire Quran and I found more than a hundred names for the Day of Judgment. All of them giving us a different description, highlighting a different aspect, a different dimension of the Day of Qiyamah. That Allah indeed will gather you on the Day of Qiyamah. Everyone. There is no doubt about this. La rayba fi. And then Allah says, "Alladhina khasiru anfusahum, fahum la yu'minun." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying that those who have lost their souls, they are the ones who don't believe, and they will never believe. Brothers and sisters, throughout life, you may lose wealth, you may lose your health, you may become ill, you may lose worldly possessions, you may lose a loved one. But all of those things, whether they're wealth, material possessions, loved ones, those things that you're losing are not a part of you. They have independence. Your wealth is not you. It's something independent of you. When you lose a loved one, they are independent of you. But when you lose your soul, what does that mean? You're losing something that is a part of you. You're losing yourself, but خَسِرُ and fusam. What does it mean to lose your soul? Brothers and sisters, our goal in life is essentially according to Islamic philosophers is to remove the restrictions around our existence the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mawjud he's in existence out of everything that Allah has created he is an existent that has the least limitations. Now the exist the existent that has no limitations is Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, because he did not lose his soul, because he nurtured his soul, a lot of the limitations and the restrictions on his existence were lifted. And that's why Rasulullah is able to occupy the highest levels of Jannah. You see, brothers and sisters. When you enter, when inshallah, if we enter paradise, it's not that it's possible for you to go to the higher levels, but there is a sign that says, do not enter. Your existence cannot handle those realms. In the same way, your body now is not suitable to be in outer space. Your body can't handle it. There are levels of Jannah that cannot be handled unless your soul is prepared for it. So khusran nafs is the greatest loss because you are keeping yourself at a very low existential level. This is why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ ثَمَنٌ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ There is no price for your soul ex except paradise. فَلَا تَبِيُعُوهَا إِلَّا بِهَا so do not sell your soul for anything that is beneath it. Because if you do that, you are placing restrictions upon the soul. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, the final ayah, He says, وَلَهُ Again, speaking about this concept of divine ownership of all things. And this is why He's able to destroy and punish those, the superpowers of the past, these nations that were incredibly powerful, because he owns he owns everything in the heavens and the earth. Ayah number thirteen: Walahu ma sakana fil layli wa nahar. To him belong whatever dwells. Sakana means dwell. Here it doesn't mean 
Sakana is the opposite of harakah. Because in the Arabic language, sakana could mean to remain still, motionless. And the opposite of sakana is harakah, movement. But in this context, the word sakana means to dwell. So if I say, ana sakin fi Seattle, I'm using the word sakin, but that, does that mean I, I sit motionless in Seattle? It means, it means no. I live, I, I live in Seattle. I dwell in Seattle. Here, what is Allah saying? He possesses everything that dwells in the night and in the day. It's interesting, brothers and sisters, that anywhere you go in the universe, there's either darkness or there's light. On earth, you have certain hours of darkness and you have certain hours of light. There are certain planets that have extremely long periods of darkness. Other planets may have extremely long periods of light. In fact, there was an article that I was reading today that says the majority of the universe is darkness. And by darkness, we're speaking about its absence of any visible light. And perhaps this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Layl before Naha. Because if you look at all of the created beings, there are probably more created beings that dwell in darkness than in light. If you take the ocean, for example, only Allah Azza wa Jal knows how many creatures live in the depths of the oceans. So the, the, the creatures that dwell in the darkness, perhaps outnumber the creatures that dwell during the day, dwell in the daylight. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the previous ayah, Allah was saying what? Say to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and on the earth. This is a reference to the idea that Allah is the owner of all space. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to day and night, light and darkness, which is a reference to time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about space and time, that He is not only the creator of space and time, He is the owner of space and time. Anything that is occupied by space and time is under His control. So again, the audience is Quraysh that you think you're invincible in the face of a Lord who has destroyed nations of the past for their iniquity, who owns everything that's in the heavens and the earth, who possesses every creature that dwells in the darkness and the night. Many of you may be familiar with the word Samir. Sami' means the one who's listening. But here Allah says he is Sami'. Many of us are familiar with the word Alim, a scholar, a knowledgeable person. But here Allah doesn't say, Wa huwa Sami'ul Alim. Why? Here Allah says, Huwa Sami' al Alim. For those of you who've studied Sarf, this is known as Sigha Mubalagha. If I say someone is Sami, it could mean that they can hear at this moment, but their faculty, their sense of hearing could perhaps diminish and they can lose their sense of hearing later on. Sami may be able to hear now, but later may not be able to hear. But Sami' is always able to hear, and he's always listening. Alim may have knowledge now, but maybe later on he'll become senile. He'll forget. There are many ulama at the end of their lives, their knowledge begins to diminish. But Allah says, I'm not alim, I'm alim. My knowledge is fixed. It's not going to fluctuate like the knowledge of the human being. وَلَهُ مَا سَكَنَ فِي اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ 
Inshallah, the next ayah will cover it next week because it requires uh, a bit of uh, elaboration. Inshallah, we have about uh, we have some time for uh, for questions and answers. Wassalamu ala Muhammad wa alihi tahirin. If there are any questions, please feel free to uh, present them. Assalamu alaikum, Mulana. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Mulana, one of the things you explained today uh, was the rahmah of Allah and that this is the most, uh, the most highlighted attribute of Allah in the Quran. No. Um, so now my question is, why is it then that many people, and maybe most people in my viewpoint, are, are fearing Allah more than they, um, they understand his rahmah or accept his rahmah? Mm. You know, it's, there has to be a balance, of course. You know, when we say that you should be hopeful in Allah's mercy, that's why we have a hadith that the mu'min is always between the world of al-khawf wa raja if you're only thinking about Allah's mercy and you're not reminding yourself that, yeah, he's Arham al rahim but he's also Shadeed al one, one, one of the sins is Al-Amnu min makrillah, is to feel safe from Allah's punishment. There has to be balance. That I, I am hopeful in Allah's mercy, but I'm also cognizant that, that I could be punished too. But Allah's, our hope, should be a little bit more than our fear in it, but there needs to be a level of balance. But I agree with you. I think that this this comes from a lack of education. You know, many many children are taught, for example, pray because if you don't pray, Allah's gonna punish you. Wear hijab because if you don't wear hijab, Allah's gonna punish you. We develop when we teach our children Islam, we teach them Islam in a way where they're obeying a Lord who is itching to punish them. When in reality, we need to introduce Allah to our children and our youth and our communities in the way that Allah introduces Himself to us. We have to build a love relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not a relationship based solely on fear. And in fact, our fear of Allah needs to be rooted in love. In the same way that when you love someone so dearly, you're afraid to offend them because you don't want to insult your beloved. So even the fear needs to be rooted in love. You know, there's a, there's a very beautiful story, and I'll share it with you, you know, since we're speaking about the topic of divine mercy. During the time of Musa, السلام, there was a drought. Bani Israel... They saw that their livestock is dying, their crops are dying. So they go to Musa. They say, Ya Musa, there's a famine, there's a drought. Can you raise your hands and dua? Can we pray for rain? So Musa says, let's go and recite Salatul Istisqa. Let's go out to the open desert and let us invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send down rain. Musa alayhi salam goes, probably with his brother Harun, they all go to the desert and they begin to supplicate to Allah for rain. Hours go by, days go by, there's no sign of any clouds, no rain. So Musa alayhi salam, he says, he asks Allah, Ilahi, you are the most merciful, you are the most compassionate, you are the loving one. We've been begging you beseeching you for days to send down some rain but you're not answering us why is it Allah says to Musa Ya Musa there is a sinner among you there is a person among you in the congregation that has committed so many heinous crimes so many cardinal sins that as long as he's among the jama'ah I'm not gonna respond to your dua so Musa alayhi salam, he stood when he received this revelation. He stood in front of Bani Israel. He says, Oh Bani Israel, oh my people, 
I, th there is a reason why Allah is not answering our dua is because there is a wicked person among us. And as long as this person is among us, our dua will not be answered. So I ask whoever this sinner is to remove yourself from the congregation. The man who was the sinner who had committed all of these acts of transgression, he was listening. And he was really in a predicament. He thinks to himself that this is a big problem. If I stay, our dua is not going to be answered. If I leave, I'm going to be exposed. Everyone is going to look at me and say, you're the sinner. They're going to insult me. I'm going to be humiliated. So he, he doesn't know what to do. So at that moment, he says, oh Allah, please forgive me. I'm embarrassed. I'm, I repent to you. He does the best thing a sinner can do, and that is to return to his Lord. So he, between him and Allah, he repents. After a short while, the, crowd, the clouds begin to appear and it begins to rain. Now Musa alayhi salam, he's, he's confused because he sees no one left. It's an open desert. If someone had left, he would have noticed. So he asks Allah, because he's kalim Allah, he's able, he has this open communication with Allah. Musa, his soul is so pure that there's no hijab. It's just open communication. He says, Ilahi, what happened? You said that there was a sinner among us, and this is why our supplication was not answered. And I didn't see anyone leave, but you still sent down rain. Allah says to Musa, O oh Musa, my abd, my servant, return to me. Musa alayhi salam, he was curious. He says, Ilahi, who was the sinner who did tawbah? Can you reveal his identity to, to me? Allah Azza wa Jal says to Musa, O oh Musa, I did not expose him when he was a sinner. Do you want me now to expose him now that he has come back to me? Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of Allah's names is what? Sattar al -uyub. Allah is the concealer of faults. This is why Ahlul Bayt, they say what? Takhallaqu bi akhlaq Allah. Acquire Allah's akhlaq, Allah's policy Allah conceals faults and he, he, he reveals people's good qualities with us what do we do we hide the good that people do and we expose their faults and we are hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show us mercy so I think if we share these types of traditions and these stories with our children we can foster a love relationship with Allah subhanahu Malana, I'm just thinking out loud again, actually. <laughs> just basically, uh, the question this brother asked, I think one reason for fear is human beings normally fear the unknown. It's the fear of the unknown. And when you think of the life after death, or you think of death, or you think of just the grave and all that, it's just darkness. So it's the fear of the unknown. And you, you sure it's talk about Rahman and all that, but the fear can be felt very strongly. Mm. And that might be one reason why the fear is so prominent, so strong compared to the rest. And, 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 and as I said, the fear has to be there. I mean, th that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't only give us descriptions of Jannah in the Quran. He also gives us some very graphic descriptions of Jahannam. Because the reality is, most people are not going to obey Allah because of a promise of a reward. And what, the proof of that is how many of us pray Salatul Layl regularly? We don't. Why? Even though Allah has promised a reward that's beyond our comprehension. But why don't we abandon Salatul Dhuhr wal Asr? Because if we do, there's a punishment if we do. Mm -hmm. Salatul Layl, if you abandon it, there's no punishment. Human beings, they, they, respond, more, they, they respond better to, uh, to threats, unfortunately, than promise of reward. Unfortunately, this is the nature of, of people. So Allah understands the psychology of the human being that, you know, it giving warning and threatening with punishment is a more powerful incentive to do good and to obey than, you know, uh, promising reward. So you find that the Quran is, is pretty balanced. 
in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the you know wa'ad and wa'id, promise of reward and uh, warning of punishment. Now the Quran the Quran places a great deal of emphasis on the pursuit of knowledge. I mean, we have, as, as you know, many ahadith, utlubul ilm min al mahdi al lahad, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. And here, knowledge is a reference to knowledge that is gonna, that's gonna deepen your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when a person truly has a deep relationship with Allah, they become greatly beneficial to other human beings. Because the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you become like a mirror that reflects Allah's asma. But going back to your question, how, how, much, how much is necessary for us to know? From a fiqhi perspective, the amount of knowledge that you need is the knowledge that you need to fulfill your religious obligations. You know, to do your prayers, your fasting, to provide for your family, if you need to learn a certain skill set, because providing for your family is also a religious responsibility. So, this may require you to learn a certain trade so you can provide for your family. So what is required of you, knowledge-wise, is to acquire the knowledge that you need to fulfill your religious obligations. And when I say religious obligations, I'm not only speaking about rituals. Religious obligations, you know, also means providing for your family, which could entail, you know, studying a certain science and getting a certain degree in a field. But of course, it's recommended, it's recommended to go beyond that. You know, Allah doesn't want us to all only shoot for the bare minimum. You know, unfortunately, you know, my criticism of, you know, a lot of, our, of myself and, and others is that when it comes to our religion, we're, uh, when it comes to dunya, we're very ambitious. But when it comes to akhirah, we settle for mediocrity. When I want to buy a house, I want to buy the best house. But when I think about my house in Akhira, we say, as long as I'm not in Jahannam, I'll be okay. Right? So we need to develop this, this ambition for the high degrees of the Akhira. And, and knowledge, you know, being among the ulama is, is a status symbol on the Day of Judgment. That the ulama, the true ulama, who have knowledge and who practice what they preach, Allah will give them the ability to intercede for others. So if you elevate your knowledge and you become a person of ilm, not only are you able to gain salvation, but you become a bridge for other people. That Allah will say to you that you have the, you have the power to do shafa'ah for a hundred people. So because you spent a lifetime gaining knowledge, you can rescue many people on the day of Qiyamah. Because of how how sacred knowledge is in the Islamic tradition. And, and, and I'm a big believer in the saying that goes, know everything about something and something about everything. Meaning, specialize in one field. Become an expert in something. Know everything about something, but know something about everything. Be also well-rounded. Don't have tunnel vision where, you know, if you're a doctor, you know, a kidney specialist, it would be a tragedy if all you know in life is the kidney. You know, read about other different fields, become a well-rounded person. You know, know, know a little bit about sociology, about politics, about philosophy. And this is only possible if someone is an avid reader. You have to read. I mean, many people ask me, Sheikh, do you only read Quran and religious books? I tell them, no, sometimes I read the New York Times. Sometimes, you know, I read novels. You know, I read... You know, confessions of an economic hitman. You have to become well-rounded. You know, you know. There's a hadith that says, "Al-alimu bizamanihi, the person who knows his time, is not overcome by confusion and ambiguity. That the, our twelfth Imam wants people who are well-rounded. He doesn't only want someone that just knows the fiqh of salah and that's it. We live in a we live in the information age, so you have to make a concerted effort to be a very well-rounded uh, person. I have a question. So you said that the role of Alim and philosophers is to remove the restrictions around our existence. And uh, these restrictions are um, more like preparation of our soul that make us ready to go higher in the levels of Jannah. So uh, obviously when we do not uh, do what we are expected to do as Muslims or 
uh, go against the word of Allah, we restrict our soul. So I was wondering that are we born with some of these restrictions or when we are born, is it human nature that uh, we have to develop from that nature to a better nature when we are born and towards the end of life, we have to be better? Or is it that we are born pure and we don't have any restrictions and then uh, we make all these restrictions upon ourselves? It's a very good question. Now, of course, in the Islamic tradition, we believe that, you know, كل مولود يولد على الفطرة that every child is born pure, you know, with this, you know, uh, natural disposition, this natural recognition of Allah. Are there restrictions? Of course, Allah says in the Quran that هو الذي أخرجكم من بطون أمهاتكم لا تعلمون شيء. You came out of the wombs of your mothers not knowing anything. Not knowing anything is a limitation. So you find that we are born pure, but we're born in a way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects growth. In the same way, when you plant a seed and that, that first leaf comes out, it sprouts, it's pure, but it still needs to grow. So I think we need to uh, distinguish between purity and maturation. That the human being is born pure, but spiritually, you haven't reached maturation yet because this spiritual maturity is reached through ubudiyah. That's why you find that Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi at the age of 63 is not like Amir al-Mu'mineen at the age of 20. Of course, he's ma'asum all the way through, but the spirituality of the imam at 63 is higher than the imam's spirituality at 20. In fact, even Rasulullah, in our salah, what do we say in the in the tashahud? We make a dua. Warfa darajata. We ask Allah to elevate the status of the Prophet. What does that mean? It means even the Prophet can get closer to Allah. Even the Prophet is on a continuous journey of spiritual growth. So we're all born pure, but the opportunity for growth is endless. I hope did that answer the question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. When it comes to, we have to keep in mind that it's not our job to label someone as a good person or as a bad person. We leave this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the day of judgment, we don't judge people. Allah judges them, right? Allah, he is the judge of the day of judgment. But what we do know is that the Holy Prophet told us that Quran is not enough. The Prophet said, that I'm leaving behind two things. That if you follow both of them, you're never going to go astray. And those two things are what? The Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. Now you may meet some people who adhere only to the Qur'an and they don't. Many of them may not know the Ahlul Bayt. You know, alhamdulillah, we are fortunate that, you know, we have parents who introduced us to the school of Ahlul Bayt. Others maybe didn't have that opportunity. So instead of labeling them as a bad person, Give them the benefit of the doubt that, you know, maybe they don't know. Maybe I can attract them to the madhab of Ahlul Bayt. Maybe I can invite them to the mosque for dua kumayt so they can listen to uh, some of the supplications of our imams and, you know, pray for their guidance and Allah opens their eyes up to the truth. But I think we should always avoid pointing the finger and labeling someone as a good person, as a bad person. I think the best thing, focus on being a good person and then leave the judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you for the lecture that you were giving it to us. It was very, um, you know, for myself, it was very, you know, increased my awareness. And, uh, and my question is, the day of judgment exists because of the uh, Rahma, because God is Rahman. That means he, uh, uh, we, we have to face the, the day of judgment. But Mike, I am not very really clear about the part that you mentioned because we have eternal life. And um, to me, is when you say that we have uh, eternal life and we are facing the uh, in front of God on the day of judgment, and we will go to uh, some process to be purified more, to go to higher level, um, I don't know, maybe 
there are some after time of that or um, because of the process of evolution that we have to face on the day, the day of judgment because it's not very clear to me that uh, when you say because we have eternal life we have to face the day of judgment could you explain it more what, what I was arguing is that the ayah where Allah says كَتَبَ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ that he's prescribed mercy upon himself and لَيَجْمَعَنَّكُمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامِ that Allah will resurrect you and the day of judgment is, the be is essentially the beginning of that eternal world now what I was saying is that every human being craves eternal life if, if, I, if I made the offer for eternal life everyone want, no one no one wants to die everybody craves eternity and the idea is that the day of judgment because it's the day after which there is no life this is, so that's why some ulama they say it's called yawm al qiyam because after it there's no more there's no more night in jannah there's no darkness it's just degrees of nur allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us existence when he created us and the example that I gave is that existing is something that's very precious. Allah is too merciful to give us something that's so precious and sweet and then take it away from us. In the same way that if there's a child that craves food and they're hungry, you don't just give them a small little bite and then you take it away knowing that they're hungry. You give them to satisfy their hunger. Allah put this hunger for eternity in us. It would be unfair and it would not be merciful of him to give us this craving for eternal life and only give us existence for a short period of time and then take it away do you see the relation so this is why we're saying this ayah is using a rahmah as one of the proofs for eternal life that there's a qiyam and there's a akhira and even though now you may say how about the people who are in jahannam this is this is rahmah even the people in jahannam it's interesting that those who are being punished in Jahannam at the end of Surat and Naba, what do they say? The Kafir in Jahannam is suffering. Yes? The Kafir is saying what? I wish I was Ma'duma or Turaba. The Kafir wants to be dust. The Kafir doesn't say, I wish I didn't exist. The Kafir just says, I want to be a different type of existence. So you find that even the Kafir, even despite that incredible punishment that he's receiving, they still want to exist as a lesser form, as a different entity. So you find that this ni'mah of existence is so great that even the kafir understands it. No kafir asks Allah, oh Allah, I don't want to exist anymore. Is it clear? Well, and uh, the, um, when that uh, day starts, there is no end to it, or it's going to be, that means um people you know every individual it's getting um you know a more uh, you know uh, as i said purified to their this to the close to getting close to god to their you know close to the path to their evolution even the people in jahannam yeah. you know the one of the Urafa says that jahannam you need to look at it as a spiritual hospital you know, when, when people are sick, where do they go? They go to the hospital. Jahannam is the hospital of the spiritually sick. Some people, when they go to the hospital, they're short-term patients. You know, they, they go in and out. Others are more long-term, depending on the illness. And there are some people who have terminal illnesses who have to stay in the hospital. Those who remain in Jahannam forever, why? Because they have a terminal spiritual disease. Kufur, shirk, unjustifiable kufur or shirk. So yeah, it's a process. It's a process. And even if that process is painful, 
the blessing of existence is so great that everyone wants to exist. And this is why when Allah speaks about His Rahmah, if He were to create us and then we die and there's nothing after death, it would mean Allah was teasing us. He gave us wujud, which is something so sweet and precious, and He took it away. In the same way as the, the child who's hungry, you give them only a little bit and you take it away. And you have the power to satisfy their hunger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. I didn't confuse you more. I don't know if I confused you more. No, no, no. It was clear. Yes, I it's getting clear to me. Yes. Yes. I have a follow up of the question of uh, restrictions. Um, I think that I, I missed one part of it that I did not understand. Um, so let me rephrase it. There is, uh, we are born in a state where that needs to be developed. And then on, on the other hand, there are restrictions that need to be removed. So um, are these restrictions that I asked for is, uh, are these restrictions something that we created because of our deeds? Or is it the nature of human beings that Allah has placed some restrictions on us and we are born that way? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, these are, I mean, there, there are restrictions that can be added because of sin. And there are restrictions that are there just because that's the nature of being human. That, you know, there are certain, uh, for, like, I'll give you a very, a very simple example. You and I, we can't travel through the heavens. So it's a restriction on us, right? Rasulullah was able to go on mi'raj. Rasulullah when he was maybe a child, maybe he was he, he wasn't his soul wasn't prepared for that at the time. Not because he did anything wrong, because it takes time to get to that type of spiritual status, that uh, that spiritual maturation where you can undertake, you know, like a spiritual voyage like that. So some restrictions are just this is the nature of of being human, and these restrictions can be lifted, just like the Hadith Qudsi, Abdi. Oh my servant, obey me. If you obey me, you will be like me. How will you be like me? But this ubudiyya has to be there. That this constant ubudiyya has to be there. And that's when these limitations are lifted and you become God-like. You become, you start to develop these, uh, these abilities. But again, this should never be the goal of uh, spirituality. The goal of spirituality is not so I can become some superhuman. The goal of spirituality is Allah Himself to get close to Allah. Whether Allah removes these restrictions, allows you to see things that other people see, this is you know nurun ala nur. But this should not be the goal. When we when we engage in in worship, the goal should never be that I want to be able to see malaika or I want to be able to you know. Uh, if that's your goal, that means you're not doing it fi sabirillah. Your, your intentions are, are, are starting to get a bit cloudy. If you're making that the goal, the acquisition of these, uh, these supernatural abilities. Spirituality is all about achieving nearness to Allah. Whatever Allah chooses to give you as a result of being close to Him, you leave that to Him. He knows what's best for you. Thank you, Mulana. This was really very educational and really very informative. And actually, I personally enjoyed these sessions so much. These are very good classes for us. So much for your kind words, of which I really I don't think I deserve such praise. But I ask you, just please include me in your du'a and ask Allah to give me tawfiq and and husn al inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. So much. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much, you. brothers and sisters. And inshallah, we'll meet again uh, next week at this time. Fiamma and Salam